you very much, Jess. Let's uh, keep our Bibles open there. And you may like to follow along the outline, which is on the reverse side of the notice sheet uh, that we had as we came in. If you're visiting us today, you may also like to know that we've started a series in this uh, great book of Isaiah. We began at uh, New Year, and we're working through over the next few weeks and months uh, the first section of this um, tremendously important book. It's a huge book, as we said at the beginning, uh, 66 chapters. We're not going to try and get all the way through it in one bite, of course, but we are going to try to get into the depth of it. And already, as we've been listening to the overture, which is really the first five chapters of the book, We've learned so much about the nature of God and about his holiness, his grace and his mercy. Some time ago I was passing a little wayside uh, church and it had one of those notice boards outside uh, and it said on the notice board, when you are at the end of your tether, remember that God is at the other end. Well, yes, probably so, but um, for many people of course that's just presumption. Uh, certainly it's true though that when you are at rock bottom the only way is up and that is undoubtedly the situation at the end of chapter 5 in uh, this book of Isaiah. You remember if you've been with us the previous Sundays the opening overture of the book produces a devastating exposure of the state of God's people in Isaiah's day where he lived and prophesied in Jerusalem with its temple and its wonderful traditions right the way back through David stretching even to Abraham the great patriarch of Israel. But now it's a story of corruption and greed and religious formalism which masked a deep inner hypocrisy. We saw last week their exploitation of the poor and the disadvantaged, their cynicism about God, their rebellion against his commandments. And we've seen the uh, agenda that Isaiah unpacks in these opening chapters. Back in chapter 1, he asks the key question, how is this faithless city, this community of people who claim to belong to God but who seem to deny it by their actions, how is this faithless city to become a faithful city? And last Sunday morning in chapter 5, we looked at the Song of the Vineyard, where God appeals to anyone who will listen. He says, what more could I have done for my people? I will no longer cultivate my vineyard. I no longer care for this land. His judgment must inevitably fall on it. So by the time you get to the end of chapter 5, if you've got the text open there, verse 30, it is a very gloomy picture. If one looks to the land, behold darkness and distress, and the light is darkened by its clouds. Now the message of chapter 6 is actually the call of God to Isaiah. It's fascinating that he doesn't make it chapter 1. The other great prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, begin their books with the story of their call. But Isaiah makes us wait to chapter 6 to hear this. I think the reason is because he wants to set out in those first five chapters the devastating state of things in Judah and to show that he is no different from the people that he was called to minister to. He too was in a great uh, state of need before God. And uh, if the people, as they listen to his message, begin to sense that it is a message of comparative despair... Isaiah wants, after those first five chapters, to say, that's where I was, but look what God did for me. Now, he tells us in the first verse of the sixth chapter that it's the year of the death of King Uzziah. So we know the year is 740 BC, and Uzziah had been on the throne for 52 years. He began his reign at the age of 16, and it was a long reign of great prosperity for the first four decades. But then it all went wrong. And what happened to Uzziah was a cameo. It was a sort of miniature of what had gone wrong with the nation. Just keep your finger in Isaiah 6, and let's turn back a few uh, pages, back to page 451, uh, to the second book of Chronicles, to see what the history can teach us about this situation. You know how the prophets are speaking into their day, and sometimes we wonder, what was going on around them all the time? Well, if you look at the books of Kings and Chronicles, they give us the history of this period. 
Uh, and we learn from 2 Chronicles, chapter 26, page 451, that Isaiah's reign had been very prosperous and successful. If you look down at verse 15, just before the paragraph gap there, the last sentence, his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. And what did he do? Well, he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar. See, God had decreed that the king had certain responsibilities and privileges, but he didn't have the privileges of the priests. And yet Isaiah seems to have wanted to take that privilege to himself. Azariah, the priest, has to go in after him, and 80 priests of the Lord, men of valor, confront the king. And they say to him, verse 18, it's not for you, Isaiah, to burn incense to the Lord. That's for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated. Out of the sanctuary you must go. You've done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord your God. Then Isaiah was angry. And when he became angry, verse 19, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of the Lord. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out, because the Lord had struck him. It's a tragic end to what had been an amazing career. And for the next uh, ten years or so, the last decade of his life, he is no longer effectively the king. His son Jotham uh, is the regent in his place. And I think Isaiah is saying to us in verse 1, now just remember the story of Isaiah. It's a parable of the nation's pride and disobedience. God has prospered them in so many ways, but actually they've just taken all his gifts and decided to live in rebellion against him and to do things the way they want to. And now they are at rock bottom. What is the future for a rebellious people like that? Well, the future is not as grim as the last verse of chapter 5 would indicate. Because the God with whom we have to do is a God of grace. And there is always more grace in God. He delights to surprise us with his mercy and his compassion. The very reason why he's going to send Isaiah as his messenger is so that his grace can be made known to people. Now that would never lead us to being complacent. But it should also mean that we're never despairing people. However dark it seems, God's light can shine into that darkness. And it was in the midst of this tragic situation, verse 1, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Well now let's look at the three things that happen in this straightforward chapter, which I hope will be an encouragement to us as well as a challenge to our own situation and our own day. I saw the Lord. So first of all, there's a new encounter with God. It's as though he's saying, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the real king. I saw the king who sits on the throne that is exalted above all the earthly thrones. End of verse 5. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. That's an interesting phrase. It occurs often in uh, Isaiah, the Lord of hosts. You'll see that Lord is in capital letters, which means that it's the Hebrew word Yahweh, which speaks about the covenant faithfulness of God. He is the one who makes and keeps his promises, and he is in control of the hosts. I think that is primarily the hosts of heaven, the angelic beings that he has created, the cherubim and the seraphim, and other angels who are there to exercise uh, God's will as they do his bidding. Sometimes it's uh, uh, an Old Testament practice to call the stars the hosts of heaven. And certainly if you look up into the night sky and see the evidence of God's creation, you get an idea of his majesty and power. This is the one whom Isaiah catches something of a vision of. A king of incomparable power before whom even the invading Assyrian forces are weak and puny. So all the imagery speaks about majesty and splendor. He is enthroned far above the earth and its kingdoms. He's transcendent in his glory as the earthly temple is filled, filled simply with the outskirts 
of his robe, the train of his robe, filled the temple. Now this is a vision that God is giving to Isaiah in the context of the temple. And the vision, of course, is impressing upon him how awesome the holiness and righteousness of this great God is. The gulf between man and God is vast. We can only see the hem of his robe. But like all monarchs, he's seated on his throne and waited on by his servants. Verse 2, above him stood the seraphim. Uh, that literally means the burning ones. Those who are totally obedient to God's will and are always doing his bidding. So here's a vision of the, of the angelic beings who are constantly doing the will of God. In the vision, they have six wings, two covering their face because they do not look on God. He is too holy even for the burning ones. Two that cover their feet, which I think implies their activity, their obedience to him. Even that has to be sheltered from his all-seeing eye. And with two, they accomplish his will. They do his work. And what is it that they're doing? Well, obviously, later in the, in the chapter, we find one of them coming to minister to Isaiah. But here, in the first part of the vision, they are simply calling to one another. They are proclaiming the nature of God. And holiness and glory is their speech. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, as we've been reminded this morning, this word holy is used to describe God in his total differentness from us, his otherness from his creation. It's used over 800 times about God in the Old Testament, and it speaks, of course, of his moral excellence and his perfection and his righteousness, the fact that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. But it's more than that. It's the essential word that expresses the, the godness of God, the distinctness of God from everything that he's made. And therefore it speaks about the goodness of God, about the essence of his nature, which is revealed in the outshining of his glory, filling the whole creation. The whole earth is full of it. Now Hebrew is basically an uncomplicated language. In English we tend to have uh, an adjective and then a comparative and superlative form of the adjective. So we would say holy, there's the adjective, holier and holiest. And uh, just to make it difficult for people who are learning our language, we have all sorts of exceptions. So we don't say good, good, or goodest. We say good, better, best, and people wonder why. But we do it that way in English. But in Hebrew, you don't have comparative and superlative forms. You simply have the word repeated. So holier is holy, holy. And holiest is holy, holy, holy. This is probably not a Trinitarian reference, it's just a superlative. God is the holiest that you could ever imagine. He is set apart from us. So that even the best of human beings cannot approach anywhere near to the righteous, awesome, exalted, omnipotent God. And his presence, even at a distance, as verse 4 shows, threatens to bring down the whole temple. The foundations shake at the seraphs' voices as they proclaim God's presence and the house is filled with smoke. The Old Testament uh, manifestation of the presence of God, the fire and smoke of him being with his people. Now if the faithless city is going to be transformed, here is the first essential. Put it this way, if sinners are going to be changed into the likeness of God, we have to recognize who God really is, the Holy One of Israel. And Isaiah, you see, cannot come any closer or see any more clearly than this amazing vision, which was in itself a huge privilege, but it was just the outskirts of the vastness and awesomeness of God. He is utterly other than Isaiah. He is superior in power and righteousness, and we deserve nothing from him but his judgment in the consuming burning fire that burns up everything that is evil. Now, when you put that vision of God with what was going on in Judah, 
Do you remember last week, just across the page in chapter 5, verse 19, their attitude to God? Let him be quick, let him speed his work, that we may see it. We don't believe in your statements about God's judgment, Isaiah. Let the counsel of the Holy One draw near. Let it come, that we may know it. That cynical, critical negativism. And now, you see, we're shown the one whom they are denigrating and mocking. There will never be a deep work of God to produce the transformation into increasing godliness that we need to see in our own lives until we have a deep awareness of God in his holiness and glory. That glory fills the whole earth. Look around and you see the manifestations of his creating power. But the holiness is the expression of his perfect nature. And so what we are to do is not primarily to be creatures fearful before a powerful creator. We are to be sinners and recognize ourselves as such before a holy God. I saw the Lord. Interestingly, in the New Testament, this event is described in John's Gospel as seeing Jesus. Uh, It quotes from these very verses, and we're told that this was what Isaiah had in mind when he recorded it. Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord Jesus. Because, of course, as he looked at God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he saw the person of Christ insofar as he could see anything of God. So when we look at God in these ways, let's not just think of him as some remote uh, figure or even just as the Heavenly Father, but let's recognise that this God is both Son and Spirit as well as Father. And that everything that we later see in the New Testament, in the Gospels, about the character of the Lord Jesus eloquently expounds this utter holiness of God, this total otherness which characterises him. So John says at the beginning of his Gospel, doesn't he, we've seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's how you see the glory of God. The whole world is full of his grace and his truth. And we need a new encounter with this God. Verses 5 to 7 show that that led to a new awareness of sin. Verse 5, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. Now, Isaiah's immediate response is, I'm finished. I'm lost. I'm done. In other words, there is a new and deep conviction of his own sin and unworthiness before this great king. And the focus is his lips. The seraphim can sing God's praises. They can sing holy, holy is the Lord. But how can sinful man? That was the question which our opening hymn posed. But God is going to use Isaiah as a prophet to speak his words. And so by his grace he's going to meet him, making him aware first of all of his total unworthiness vis-a-vis God. His total moral culpability in God's sight. But if God is going to use his lips to speak his word, then at that very point where God wants to use this man's life in a fresh way, that is where he has to acknowledge his own sinfulness, and that is where he has to know the holiness and grace of God. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the lips speak. So before Isaiah can be commissioned, the vision of this God, who who he really is, brings to him a deep conviction of his own sin. I wonder if you've ever seen yourself and seen God in that perspective. I wonder if we've ever genuinely been so moved from our hearts that we have to say, woe is me, I'm lost. I don't have a leg to stand on. I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, of course, that word unclean was the cry that the leper had to make. That was what Isaiah, the king who's just died, was saying for the last ten years of his life. Unclean, unclean. That's what the nation is like. Unclean. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And I know that, verse 5 says, because I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. You don't know it until you see who God is. What is real inside is revealed in the light of God's burning purity. 
I'm finished. That's the end of it. Oh, no, it isn't. There is always grace. Verse 6. One of the seraphim, obviously at the command of God, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Look, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and as for your sin, it has been covered. It is atoned for. Well, here is the amazing grace of God in action. Aware now of just how deep his sin is, almost immediately God makes him aware of the fact that on the altar, which is of course the place where the sacrifice for sinners is being offered, an atonement is made for sin. And as he sends the seraph from the altar of sacrifice at the specific command of God, because the origin of salvation is always in the will of God alone, it's because this offering has been made for sin at the altar that the cleansing, the fire, can be applied to Isaiah's lips in symbolic form. And more important than that, the announcement can be given to him, your guilt taken away and your sin covered. The remission of your sins is real. The ransom price has been paid. The debt has been met. And so what he is being taught is that this awesome holiness of God, which would otherwise consume us all, is satisfied at the altar of sacrifice. And a new start is possible. Against the backdrop of God's overwhelming holiness, only he can deal with the problems of our human sin. So when I see who God is, and when I see who I am before him, then I know how much I need that cleansing that comes from the sacrifice. For us, the sacrifice of the God who revealed his glory in Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of the obedient son who went to the death of the cross so that we could be forgiven, the sacrifice that comes to us from the altar of Calvary. And that is where we find our cleansing. That is why we come back day by day to the cross of Christ. That's why we, every time we're convinced and convicted afresh of our sins, we know how much we need his cleansing and we praise him that we can come because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, goes on cleansing us from all our sin. But that cleansing only comes through confession and that confession only comes because of conviction. See, that's the process. The conviction leads to the confession, leads to the cleansing. And if I want to be anything for God, and if I want my life to count in any way for his glory, it's got to be that process. I've observed over the years that almost every ministry that God uses, you will find that there's a critical awareness of personal sin and failure in the people God uses. There's a personal awareness of our wretchedly sinful nature, a transforming encounter with holiness, which in God's mercy starts to eradicate all our pride and false confidence in ourselves. There is a sense in which, to quote Isaiah later, we have to come to see that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in God's sight. That overwhelming light from God when that begins to get into our souls, when I begin to say, yes, I'm a man of unclean lips, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, when I think about how that spreads out into all areas of my life, it's selfishness, it's unbelief, it's unthankfulness, it's disobedience, until I know deep in my being within us, within me, that my flesh, apart from God, contains no good thing. I'm not going to be much of an ambassador for his saving grace. See, words like sin and grace and love and faith have very superficial meaning until we see them in relation to the Holy One. Because they derive their meaning from whom he is. And our response must be to him. That leads us to our third and last point. The new encounter with God that leads to a new awareness of sin which would be full of despair were it not for the sacrificial work of Jesus that covers our sins through his blood shed on the cross. But that leads to a new realism in service. Because now the one who was excluded 
is welcomed into the very presence of the Lord. And he finds that there's a missionary committee meeting going on in heaven, and the Lord is deliberating about which candidate to send to his rebellious people, Israel, to declare his mind to them. Verse 8, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Plural, Trinitarian, maybe. Then I said, here am I. Could it possibly be me? Now this is Isaiah's call to ministry. It changed his life. It wasn't initially a direct summons. It came out of the deep conviction that was born in his own heart about the holiness of God and the need of himself and his nation. And he knows that that is what he now longs to do with his life. Lord, here I am. Could it possibly be me? See, the mark of really experiencing God is not some emotional high. It's a life of devoted service. And God says, go. And Isaiah must have been, at one level, thrilled and at another level, daunted by that. But what a surprising commission he's given. Go. Go to restore this people in a great national revival. Well, apparently not. Go and say to them, verse 9, keep on hearing but don't understand, keep on seeing but don't perceive, and as you minister my word, you will be making the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and their eyes blind. That's an extraordinary commission, isn't it? Faithful ministry hardens hearts as well as softens them. And Jesus quotes these verses about his own ministry, and Paul quotes them about the Gospel's ministry in the New Testament, and they say that this is what being a messenger of God usually looks like. Isaiah preached with such simplicity and clarity that the sophisticates in Jerusalem wrote him off. When you get to chapter 28, you find that they say, oh, he teaches nursery rhymes, he just speaks childish gibberish. But God requires faithfulness, And he'll look after the outcome. So Isaiah's reaction in verse 11 is very understandable, isn't it? All right, Lord, that's a very hard task to do that, to go on preaching and preaching and seem to have no impact, no result. But how long is it going to take, Lord? And he said, and then you get this devastating statement in 11 and 12, until the cities are wasted, until the land is desolate, And even when it seems as though God's judgment has been enacted on it, though a tenth remain, verse 13, that will be burnt again. So it's going to be a period of immense judgment from God that the people will face. They will reject what he says so resolutely that in the end it becomes impossible for them to turn. So does the chapter end in gloom? No, it doesn't. There is always more grace. And the grace is in that last sentence. Just like the oak when its stump remains after the tree has been felled, and within that stump there may yet be life, so in the stump of the reduction of the people of God through the exile and through the judgments of God in history does not mean that God's purposes are finished. The holy seed, the Messiah, is the stump. And that old root of Jesse that gave birth to David and to all the kings and in the end uh, led to their exile and to the apparent destruction of the kingdom was not finished. The promise to Abraham's seed found its fulfilment in Christ. In the stump was the holy seed out of which the branch of Jesse came, out of which the Messiah was born and the blessings came to the Gentiles. So as we conclude, what what does this really have to teach us as we want to live for God this week? What did God do for Isaiah? Well, what he did for Isaiah, he's willing to do for all his people. So we should never give up hope of God's divine intervention in unexpected ways in our own lives, in our friends' lives, in our nation. So often the darkest night has proved to be the herald of God's bright new dawn. God is in the business of changing sinful rebels into loving servants. But the only way that can happen is for us to come to an end of ourselves, as Isaiah did, 
And we can't bring ourselves to that. That will only happen deep down when we begin to listen to God's voice and not reject it, not harden our hearts, and to begin to understand the, the awesome otherness of God, the holiness of God. Because the issue for the church in our land and for us as individual Christians today is who is the king and who is the servant? See, as long as we think we can solve the problems with a little help from God, but mainly by our hard work and our commitment and doing all the right things, then we are on the throne and God is our servant. And that's got to be wrong, hasn't it? This God is not our buddy. He's not our best mate. I'm horrified when I hear even Christians talking about the man upstairs. When we assume somehow that God is on a level with us. Now what the church needs today is this new overwhelming vision of holiness, of the greatness of God. That God shares his amazing mercy and grace with us, but he doesn't indulge us. He isn't a, a Father Christmas in the sky figure. The temptation is that if God is on our level, we will accommodate the gospel that we believe in and the message that we proclaim to the level of the culture around us. And the church is doing that in many places across the world. Some people think it's cutting-edge Christianity, but actually it's as though the holiness of God doesn't really exist. That the Christian church is just a club of like-minded people and we're all doing our little bit in the world and, uh, well, God is almost unnecessary. So you get followers of Christ, so-called, whose greatest value is their own material and spiritual comfort because we become obsessed about numbers and commercially successful Christian operations. We need a vision of who God is. We need to be brought before him to recognise that we're lost, we're undone without him. In a very uh, telling book which David Wells, the American uh, uh, theologian and commentator on our culture, wrote a couple of years ago, a book called The Courage to be Protestant, he says these words with which we're going to conclude. If we could see more clearly God in the full blaze of his burning purity, we would not be on easy terms with all the sins that now infest our souls and breed easy compromises with the spirit of the age. This is what leads us to the casual ways in which we live our lives with their blatantly wrong priorities. If we could see this more clearly, the church would be more filled with repentance and in consequence much more joy and much more authenticity. In short, God's strategy for the faithless city and the people of unclean lips is to reveal himself in all his holiness and to bring them and us to a deeper awareness of his total supremacy, his awesome righteousness, so that instead of resisting, we repent. And instead of being terrified, we quietly thank God for such a sacrifice that Jesus made, which is, enables us to draw near in faith and to know that by his death, our guilt is taken away. Our sin has been atoned for. And then we can start to rejoice that the Lord is King and that he has a work for us to do. Let's pray. Jesus said, Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Father, we know how much we need this vision of you in your greatness, firstly in the majesty of your holiness and then in the glory of your mercy. And so we ask for it. We seek it, Lord. We pray that you will give to us a deeper, deeper, richer understanding of who you really are. And that we may know what it means to say, I'm lost, woe is me. 
and yet also to know what it means to say that the blood of Jesus, God's Son, has cleansed us and goes on cleansing us. Thank you for that altar of sacrifice on that cross outside Jerusalem that Friday afternoon so many years ago. And thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus to go on making us clean. Help us, Lord, as we go out to serve you. As we say to you this morning, Lord, here we are, send us. Help us to go out in the strength of that conviction. And may our lives, because they've been touched by your holiness, reflect your glory wherever we go this week. For the honour of your name we ask it. Amen.